Hey, this is Brock Lemire. We're continuing our study of embedded systems design. We're looking at the integrated, inter-integrated circuit or I squared C bus uh, peripheral on the MSP430. And in this video, we're going to now look at the basic hackett structure of an I squared C message. Okay, so <clears throat> we talked about how a there's multiple devices that can be on an I squared C bus. Okay, one the master is the device that is going to initiate the communication. Okay, now you can have multiple masters on a bus. That's absolutely true, but the master is who is going to initiate the transaction or the transmission for any given message. Okay, so <clears throat> in, in general, MCUs tend to be the master uh, <clears throat> just because you have more knowledge about what's going on. And then slaves tend to be something that, they're usually like sensors, data loggers, they're, they're things that kind of just run independent and then the master goes out and pulls them for information. So that's kind of the general use model. But you can absolutely have multiple masters, it's just that this is a half duplex link. So you cannot have multiple masters driving at the same time. So for our uh, for our study, we just say, okay, we're gonna have a master and it's gonna be the one that initiates uh, initiates the message, okay? All right. <laughs> okay, so what's a slave? A slave is a device that is going to be read or written to in a given transaction, okay? Now, this the master is what generates the clock, the slave does not generate the clock. Okay. Now, here's a key concept of I squared C. A slave has a unique address, and it's predetermined. So these addresses are usually hard-coded into the circuit itself. Uh, so like you'll when you go find an I squared C device that's going to behave as a slave, it'll actually, like you look in the data sheet, and it'll have an address. It'll be like, my address is 82. <clears throat> some I squared C slave devices will have like some of the address provided, so maybe they'll have like the first four bits inside of this chip, and then you can provide the next bits uh, by using pull-up or pull-down resistors external to the device. But it's it's key that it has a hard-coded address, so it's got a slave address on there, so that's very important. And then, of course, when you're building the circuit, you're building the link, the master has to know what the hard-coded addresses of all the slaves are. It's not something that it figures out at runtime. It's It knows it it knows in the software the addresses, okay? And the master uses these addresses to figure out or to, to go out and indicate who on the I squared C bus it's talking to, okay? All right, so let's, uh, a couple terms. Uh, when the bus is idle, that means that nobody is sending information around. And if you remember the open drain source, uh, open drain output stage, uh, what happens is basically, Every device just writes a you know a zero to the output stage, and that that turns off the transistor, the NMOS transistor. So nobody is pulling the lines down. That allows the pull up resistors on S clock uh, and S data to be pulled to a logic high. So when everybody sees the the signals just sitting at a high, they know that the bus is idle and that at any given time a master might initiate a transaction, but but everything is idle and nobody gets a clock. The clock is just held high. We say that the bus is busy when there is something going on, when there's traffic on the bus. And so as a slave or a, as a master, I guess, if you see transactions, you know that the, the bus is busy and you don't want to start a, a transaction. Now we call transactions, tr officially we call them a message. And so we, we link all the, or we uh, group all the different stuff that goes into an I squared C packet. We, we call it a message, okay? So that's the technical term. So we'll, we'll try to start calling it message from here on out. So now this picture right here, I show S clock and S data, and these are both at a logic one right here. And then we're gonna kind of unveil <laughs> a full message as we go and talk through it, okay. So now a master initiates a new message by generating what is called a start bit. So the start bit is, is created by pulling SDA low before the clock. And then what happens is that a, a little bit later, it pulls the clock low. And then from then on out, it is now ready. And so everybody sees that the clock has gone low and it's like, oh, holy cow, every, something's going on. A master is initiating a message. Okay, so that's how it starts going. And then from then on out, the master pulses the clock 
uh, <clears throat> throughout the rest of the message. Okay, so the master is doing is doing the clock. Now again, the clock, the way the master does it is it pulls it low, lets the resistor pull it high. Let's pulls it low, lets the resistor pull it high. But just know the master is the one that's actually toggling the clock. Okay. Okay. Now each clock pulse within a message is numbered. And so there's going to be these predetermined numbers that are associated with the clock pulse. And this is important to know because when you go look at data sheets, you'll see these, these tables that say uh, in period you know, 18, you'll see this bit. And then period 9 to 28, you see this. And you're like, what in the world are they talking about? Well, it's a message is, is numbered. And so it's very, it's very specific what goes on on each clock cycle. Okay. And so by knowing the numbers, the master and the slave essentially count the clock pulses and they know where they are in the message and what should be happening at, at that particular period. Okay. All right. So then after the, the start bit, then the master provides the slave address and the slave address can be seven bits uh, long or it can be 10 bits long. So seven is always the default. That's, that's absolutely the, the most common thing you see. And if you think about seven bits, that is enough to address 128 slaves. And so that just gives you an idea of how many devices you can hang off of an I2C bus. 10 bits is like, holy cow, that's that's a ton. I mean, if you do 2 to the 10, I mean, what what is 2 to the 10? That's like uh, 256, 5, it's like 1024. So you, if you use a 10-bit address, you can address over 1,000 devices. So that just gives you an indication. It's like, holy cow, I swear it's is designed to facilitate a lot of different slaves on here. But now you see, it's like, okay, so period one through seven, that is going to be you know, the slave address. And I just show that seven pulses occurred because seven bit slave address is the most common. Okay, and that's all we're ever gonna look at. Okay, so then after you provide, after the master provides the slave address, then in period eight, it provides a read or write signal. And that tells the slaves out there, hey, I'm looking for you and I would like to either read or write from you. And so the, the logic uh, polarity on here, you see read slash write with a little line over it. That means if you give a one, that means you're, the master is attempting a read. And if you do a zero, that means it's attempting a write. And so we say that periods one through eight constitute the slave address and read write signals. And every master message will have those periods. So a start bit and then eight clock periods. And you'll see why at kind of toward the end of this video that you always have that, but you don't necessarily have any more. It kind of depends. Okay. So now you, the master has put out the slave address. Every slave that sees that address then checks that address against its own internal hard-coded address. And it says, am I who the master is looking for? And if it is, it says, holy cow, the master is looking for me. I would like to let him know that, the, that I'm here. And I will do that by sending an acknowledge signal. And that is an ACK, okay? Uh, if there's nobody that is there, okay, so nobody's out there, then it's a no acknowledge. And that's called a NACK. Now, if you think about the bus, now here this comes back to this, the reason there's pull-up resistors on here. If there's an ACK, so there is a slave with the slave address that was sent, it pulls down the ACK bit, okay? If, and so an ACK is a zero in period nine. If nobody's out there, nobody recognizes the slave address and nobody does anything. So by default, that will leave the data line high. So that by architecture means that a NACK is a one in period nine. Okay, so that's how then, okay, so now you're sitting here and you're like, okay, I'm here. So let's proceed with this message as if a slave was out there that had the slave address. So there was a match, that slave acknowledged the master. Then what happens is that uh, <clears throat> the master says, okay, here comes data. And in this situation, I'm drawing this very agnostic because we really didn't tell whether we were reading or writing. Uh, we're just gonna say that these periods are represented with data. Now. It is absolutely true that data could be going back to the master or to the slave, depending on whether it's a read-write, but we, we're not looking at that right now. We're just looking at the basic structure. So then it sends the data after an ACK. And so now you're at the period 17, right? So you had seven plus one plus one plus uh, eight, and this is eight bits wide. And then when it's done, after the data, then the slave says, hey, I got it. So every time information is sent, there's an ACK. Okay, so that indicates that the message was received successfully. 
And that's very important. It's, uh, there's always acts involved after every transaction. Again, an act is where the slave says, hey, I got that data and life is good, assuming this was a right. And so then after that, if the master is done sending data, it then generates the stop condition. And so what it does is it pulls both SCL and SDA high, and then it leaves it there for multiple periods. So it's not pulsing anymore. And so then what happens is that all the slaves see that this is held high for, there's no more pulses coming. And it sees that SDA is, is high a little bit after the clock goes high. And it's like, oh, well, I guess we're done. Okay, so <laughs> there's the packet. So there it is. That would be a packet that, uh, yeah, that's a packet. All right, let's pretend now, let's go back to the beginning and let's pretend there was a knack. So I tried to write knack over there. That little red blip is a knack. <laughs> so the master initiates a start by pulling down SDA and then it, a little bit later it pulls SCL down and then it starts pulsing. And so periods one through seven are the slave address. Then it provides period eight as whether it wants to read or write. And then let's assume nobody on the bus was, or nobody on the bus had the slave address. There's no slave that pulls this down, pulls down the line. And so what happens is that it's left high by the pull-up resistor. And so the master sees a knack and says, holy cow, nobody's out there with that slave address. And then it immediately generates the stop and it, re it puts the, uh, the bus back into an idle state. So that's why I said, you're always going to see a start followed by nine periods but you don't necessarily see the rest of them unless somebody out there is uh, saying, hey, I have that slave address, okay? All right, so here's, a, here's kind of a summary of what we just covered. Uh, so here's a basic, the most basic slave, or not slave, I squared C packet, okay? You're gonna have a start, slave address. So here's, I mean, let's talk about who does what. The master generates a start, the master sends a slave address, the master sends the read-write. The slave or lack there of slave sends an ACK or a NAC, and then the data is transmitted, and it depends whether it's a read or a write, whether you're going to the master or to the slave. After every message is sent, you have an ACK, and then you have a stop bit after, if that's done. And if you count the periods, here's how it looks. It's, you have, they start counting at the slave address, so you have seven periods for the slave. Period eight is the read write, period nine is the ACK, 10 through 17 are the data, and then 18 is the ACK NAC for uh, whether it was done, and then you have the stop. You notice that you have S and P. This is the first time that I've drawn this out here. This is also very common in I squared C data sheets is you'll have S as the start, and then since S was already taken, <laughs> you can't use it for stop, so then you put P. So that's what that is. It's not polarity, it's stop. Puh. Okay, now, it, going back and just revisiting who does the acts and acts, if the master is writing to the slave, then the master sends the eight bits of data and the slave produces the ACK or NAC, okay? If the master is reading, it still sends out the slave address and the read write and would send a read signal, then the slave would ACK and say, I'm here. And then the slave would send the eight bits of data and then the master would produce the ACK or NAC signal, okay? So depending on read or write, uh, either or can provide, uh, not either or, either, one of them will produce that ACK NAC. Okay, so, but the key is that uh, the, after every message is sent, uh, the master can, can, or after every message, there's an ACMAC, okay? And after the data has been sent and acknowledged, the master can end the message anytime by generating the stop bit, okay? So the master generates a stop bit. Now, having said that, the, there are many situations where you are going to transfer multiple bytes of information, and that is absolutely allowed in a single message. So this right here shows an example of Let's say that you were going to write multiple pieces of information. You're going to write n bytes to a slave. Well, you don't necessarily need to provide the slave address every single time because you already got you, the slave is there to acknowledge and says, I'm ready for data. So the master says, start, slave address, read, write. The slave acknowledges, and then it goes, it starts pumping bytes of data of which after each one, the receiver acknowledges. So let's say you're going to write. So the master sends data one, the receiver acknowledges. Master sends data to, the receiver acknowledges. Keep sending, keep sending until it's done sending. And then the master is the one that says, okay, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> I'm out of here. <laughs> and it generates the stop bit. Okay, that is the basic packet structure of, I, of an I squared C message. And we'll stop right there. All right, as always, support my channel by subscribing and see you.